And can we say amen? Amen. 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 What a day that will be. Glory. Glory is right. When we look on Jesus' face, wow. When he takes me by his hand, he leads me through the promised land. What a day. Glorious day that will be. Thank you, Brother Dean. Especially thank you for doing that last song. Appreciate it. This morning, a welcome to everyone here this morning. I uh, trust that you have been blessed in being here, and I trust that you will be encouraged and blessed in, uh, in continuing to worship with us here this morning. A uh, special welcome to you as visitors. We have a number of visitors here. I feel sorry for some of you that need to sit way in the back. Um, seems like you're a long ways off, but anyhow, good to have you here and trust that you will be blessed in worshiping with us this morning. And uh, also, I just want to, I want to bless each one for coming out. Just, may God be with you, bless you. And also, I know there's people watching online this morning, so God be with you and bless you in a special way. And may, may uh, our Lord and Savior's name be glorified this morning. We are surely a blessed group of people, are we not? And you know, as I, as I thought of this, as I prepared for a message here this morning, I, I thought of what we, in the, past, in the past two weeks, we've heard seven messages in the past two weeks. And so we are truly a blessed people, are we not? We have the freedom. We can come together. And by the way, let me just say this. Thank you for praying for the people in Haiti. And let's make that a priority, not just once a day, but let's continue praying for them. You can't help but wonder, what is their situation like this very, mo this very moment, 11 o'clock here on a Sunday morning? What is their situation like after being held for, what, this is, I think, the ninth day? I think it is. So let's remember to pray for them. Um, but anyhow, as I thought of a message, and as I thought of the messages that we heard, uh, let me just name a few of my I want to ask you the question, how have you been doing since those messages, I mean, last two weeks ago, we heard a message on honoring, on honoring each other. Do you remember that message? It was powerful. It was by Brother Dave on honoring each other. We heard messages about being filled with the Holy Spirit. We heard messages about going into the Holy of Holies. We heard messages about Discerning the Spirit. Is it the Spirit of God? Or is it not the Spirit of God? We heard a message about popcorn Christians. Do you remember that? He talked about popcorn Christians. Powerful messages. We heard a message about either going into the Holy of Holies, going to be with God, or staying on the porch. Have you been staying on the porch? Just some of the messages we heard. We heard about poison in the pot. Do you remember that message? Poison in the pot. How have you been doing? How have you been doing dealing with the poison in the pot? And Dave referred to it as what, what we're, what we, what the, all the negative news that we hear. There's a lot of negative things out there that we hear. Poison, right? Elisha, in that pot, he threw flour into the pot. And when he put the flour in, the poison was gone. And Dave said, we have this. This is our flour. The word of God is a flour, and we can use this in our negative society. And this will cure the poison, or help. It will cure if they apply everyone's applies it, it will cure the poison in the pot. Poison in the pot. Dave mentioned control, confusion, fear with the poison in the pot. Then last Sunday, we heard a message by Brother Jared about remembrance. Remembering. Remembering what Jesus Christ has done for us and then you know, remembering his death, his suffering, 
and then the power of his resurrection, then we serve communion. So I'm here this morning, and having thought through some of these things, I had to ask myself, I'm just going to start here. There's something that came to my mind over and over again when I thought of these messages, when I thought of the message that Dave preached, thought of communion, and all that Christ has done for us. There's a couple things that went through my mind, and one of them is this, these three words, and it's the title of my message this morning, and the title of my message is, We Are More Than Conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Now let me ask you a question. What is a conqueror? What is that? But we, we are more than conquerors. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. That's what I want to... Uh, share this morning. So turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 this morning, if you would. Romans 8. This morning I'm going to be reading. I'm not going to ask you to stand simply because, you know, I, I, would, I would actually like to read the whole chapter but I I don't think I will. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And let me just, I'm I'm, going to read down through, and then I'm probably going to skip some, pick some verses out, and then continue reading again. But in Romans 8, just follow along. And I, I encourage you to do this. Read Romans 8. When you get home, read Romans 8. Don't just read it once, okay? But read it over. Then read it over again. But read Romans 8. It starts like this here in verse 1. It says, There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that It is weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace." Because, of the car- because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not, of the- but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man hath not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the- and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is, is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, if ye, we are debtors not to flesh, but to live, to live after the flesh. For ye... For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Did you get that? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For they have not received the spirit of bondage, and again to fear, but they have received the spirit of adoption. Praise the Lord, adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. For the Spirit itself bears witness against our spirit, and we are the children of God. And if children, listen to this verse, and if children then heirs, heirs of God, joined heirs with Christ, if so be it that we suffer with him, that we may also glorify together. Now, I'm going to move on down to verse 28. Verse 28 is a very familiar verse, and it says like this here, and we know that all things... Work together for the good of them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now dropping down, I want to read verse uh, 31. 
And what shall, we say then, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now let's drop down to 35. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, Jesus, as we look at these verses, there's so much in these verses, Lord, and I thank you for them. I thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, that we can have life in you, that we can be adopted, in, adopted into your family, we can be heirs of you, we can inherit what you inherit, Jesus. We thank you for that. We thank you that nothing, nothing can separate us from your great love. So this morning, for this message, God, I commit it into your hands. I pray that you would guide, you would direct, you would lead, and I pray that we can come away from here encouraged. Because Jesus, because of you, we can be more than conquerors. We praise you for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are more than conquerors. You know, my prayer is this. I hope this morning those people in Haiti somehow can realize that nothing can separate them from the love of Christ. Nothing, nothing can separate them from the love of Christ. And again, we want to continue praying for them. And the reason, the only reason that nothing can separate us from the love of God is this, because God gave his very best. Somebody tell me, what was God's very best? His only son, right? God gave his very best, he gave his only son, and nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So the question becomes, why do, why do people face, go through situations that are difficult? Why do they go through tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, it says sword? Why do they go through difficult situations? Why? It says here we're more than conquerors. Let me just, I read through that, I read this chapter over and over and over again, and, and I, I'm still, 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 Amazed at what all is in it. But let me, let me just tell you this. Let me, let me just start in verse 35. Where it says, in, well, 35 it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing can separate us. But if you drop down, you, see, you read verse 36. Where, G, where it says like this here, The gospel tells us, Paul tells us, that we are accounted as sheep. We are accounted as sheep. Interesting. Interesting. Actually, I find that very interesting. Why would we be accounted as sheep? The psalmist says this. He says in Psalm 100, verse 3, he says, Know that the Lord is God, that he made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So if we think of sheep, they don't fight back much, do they? They don't put up a battle, do they? 
We, all, we know, I know, I know that we're not as familiar with sheep, I'm not as maybe I should be, or as maybe as these people were when this word was written, but my, uh, a sheep will not fight back, will not put up a fight. So how can we be more than conquerors if we're like sheep? How? We're called to be lambs. You know, I believe sometimes us as a Christian, as a Christian community as a whole, I'm not just talking us here at Bethel, but the church. Sometimes we want to gear up. We want to arm ourselves. And we want to come out swinging, right? Wrong image. Wrong image. We're called to be sheep. We're called to be sheep, but we're called to be more than conquerors. You know, have you ever heard of a football team that's called the Lambs? <laughs> Probably not. No. They're more like the Jaguars, the Bears, the, the Lions, the Raiders, the Vikings. Name a few of them. Not Lambs. But we're more than conquerors. You know what? We don't try to conquer. We don't try to conquer. That is not our passion. That is not our purpose. That is not our priority. We are more than conquerors. So what does that mean? Let me just start with this. And, and Mark, Brother Mark has said this numerous times. As Christians and the New Testament church, we don't, we don't flex our muscles. We don't flex our muscles and go and, and I know Mark has pointed out, protest. You know, we don't. We don't take part in that. We don't go protest. Let me just, and, and, and I, I, I thought about this, and I, let me just go here with this. Jesus said this, Ye are the salt of the earth, wherewith salt, where, ye are the salt of earth, the earth, but if salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? A little bit later, he said this, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. My friends, as Christians, as believers, we're called to be salt. To be salt. Now let me say this. Salt is meant to be sprinkled, right? Salt is meant to be used. It's meant to be sprinkled on your food. You know, I, uh, I thought about this. And in, you know, if I'm in a restaurant and I get my plate of food and it tastes kind of blah, you know what, I actually Googled the word blah. I didn't know if there was a word such as blah. There actually is. It means boring. No good, not boring. That's what blah means. It tastes kind of blah. There's no flavor to it. There's no taste to it. And I take my salt shaker, and I take this, and I leave the cap on, right? And I salt it. So it has a flavor. It's tasty. It tastes good. But what if... What if I asked the waitress, and there was a time here in the last year where there was no salt shakers on the table, so you may have, may have asked, had to ask for salt. And she comes over, and she has a salt shaker, and says, here you go, guy. Uh, I got some salt for you. And she proceeds to take off the cap, and she turns the whole salt shaker upside down on my food and dumps, proceeds to empty the whole salt shaker on top of my food. Just ruined it, right? Totally ruined it. It would have been worse than tasting blah, right? It would be. There's a reason that you and I are called to be salt. To have a flavor. Something that is appealing. Something that causes a thirst. It causes people to draw after. And you know, the same thing is with light. I don't know if any of you enjoy driving in early morning or late evening, and then the vehicle coming towards you, the oncoming vehicle has their lights on high beam. I don't necessarily appreciate that. We don't, do we? We don't. 
We don't enjoy that. We don't appreciate that. Why? Well, because it blinds us. But you know what? Light. Light simply to illuminate is perfect. And that's what we need. And Jesus tells us to be light, to be a light unto the world. He calls us to be salt and to be light. You know, I put this in my notes. This, I, want you to listen. I want you to get this. We are more than conquerors. But you know what? From the world, from the world's perspective, we will never win. We won't. From the world's perspective, we will never win. And you know, I believe this. If we don't get that, that, that we, we need to be salt. We need to be light. We need to draw them to Christ. But to the world, to the total non-believer, we're losers. If we don't get that, we will be frustrated. We will be discouraged. We will be. I have one, and I thought about this. I have one Old Testament story that I want to share here this morning. And I know you've all heard this story before. Numerous times. But my friends, these men were more than conquerors. They were. And my friends, there were thousands of people that day that thought they were total losers. This is found in the book of Daniel. It's found in the third chapter of Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar a powerful king, a conqueror, he was. He was a conqueror. Nebuchadnezzar was a powerful king. He was an arrogant, arrogant king. He was a prideful king. And he was a conqueror. Whatever he said happened. He was very rich. And he could do what he wanted to do. So he built an image. An image, and I believe this image was a statue of himself that was 90 feet tall. It was nine foot wide. And he built, built this image in the plains of Dora, the Bible tells us. And he built it 90 feet, feet tall and he overlaid the whole image with gold. So you can imagine if this image is in the plain, in a flat land, in a plains land, in a flat land, and it's 90 feet tall, if the sun shone on that, it could be seen from a long ways off. And one day when it was all completed, he said, today, I want all the people to come. And the Bible tells us all languages. So there must have been, he, must, he, he conquered other countries and they all, all the different people were to come, different religions, they were to come and worship the idol. Worship the image. And he said, when the music starts playing, I want everybody to fall down and worship this image that I have erected, that I have put up. And the music begins to play, and thousands of people bow down to the image. Yes, thousands of people, but three men. Three men don't bow down to the image. Three men remain standing. And then the governors, the, the king's people, the king's men, and this is in my own words, come to Kim, King Nebuchadnezzar and they say, they say that there's a few men here. They do not worship your idol. They do not worship your, your, your what you call them. They do they not go and bow down before him. For before the idol. They do not be bow before him. And, and, and the Bible tells us that the king Nebuchadnezzar was furious. For right from the beginning it says that he was furious and he said, let them come to me. So they bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to King Nebuchadnezzar. And the king says to them, hey, didn't you understand me? I told you when the music plays, you are to bow down and worship the idol. 
And if you do not obey that, you will immediately be cast into the fiery furnace. I'll give you one more chance. It's my own words. These men say, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need another chance. We don't need another chance. You know, the God that we serve, I want you to remember this. The God that we serve, and King Nebuchadnezzar said this from the beginning. He said, and who is this God that can deliver you out of my hands? And then the men say to the king, say, we don't need another chance. We will not bow down before your idol. We will not worship your idol. We have a God that is able to deliver us out of your hands. And if he decides, if our God decides not to, it's okay. We will still not worship your idol. And then it says that his face turned extremely angry, my own words. Very angry. And he tells the men, you make that furnace seven times hotter than it was before. You heat that furnace up extremely hot. And he gets, and then the Bible tells us he, he gets the mighty men of his army together. And they bind Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego hand and foot. And they throw them into the furnace of fire. And the fire is so hot that the mighty men of his army die because of the heat. Now imagine that. We're killed because of the heat. Nebuchadnezzar is observing. He's watching. He's watching. And he looks into that fiery furnace. And, he, and I imagine he looks again. He, I imagine maybe he steps over the bodies of the dead men. And he looks into the fiery furnace and he says, did we not put three men in here? He asked his counselors, did we not put three men in the furnace here? He said, yes, king, we put three men. Well, I see four men. And they're walking around. They were bound hand and foot when they went in. They're walking around in the fire. And there's a fourth one. And he, this is what he says. He looks like the son of God. Where did he come up with that one? He looks like the son of God. That's what he says. Then he goes over to the opening of the furnace and he cries out, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, come out here. You know what our flesh would like to say? Why didn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, no, you come in here and join us for a while. You walk around with us for a while in here. That's what our flesh would like to do. But they came out. They came out of the fiery furnace. And it says that the king's men gathered around them. And they looked at them. And their, their hair were not even singed. Remember, the furnace is so hot, it killed the men. But their hair was not even singed. Their ropes must have burned off because they could walk around. But their clothes weren't burned. It says you couldn't even smell, smell smoke on them. And what happened? Nebuchadnezzar says, that God that saved you from that furnace. If anybody anywhere says anything up towards that God, he says basically they should be killed and their houses burned. If anybody says anything about the God that protected you from the furnace. Now, isn't it amazing how God glorified himself through that image. Imagine with me what happened. What happened the next, I, I, I had to wonder, how long did that image stand? How long did it stand there? If it was 20 years, hey, I don't care if it was 20 or 40 years, every time they walked by there, do you think they said, oh, that was powerful King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he built that thing there, and that's the image of him. They were reminded of the fiery furnace and the God that delivered them from the fiery furnace. My dear friends, what do we talk about today, thousands of years later? It's about the God that delivered them from the fiery furnace. And I say all that to say this. My friends, I do not believe that the three Hebrews put up a fight. 
I believe they were more than conquerors. Are you with me? Amen? They were more than conquerors. I don't think they had to say a lot. They just said, God is able to deliver us. And they were more than conquerors. Um, We're called to be sheep. Sheep of his pasture. And we're called to be more than conquerors. Now let's go back. And I spent a little too much time on there. But anyhow, let's go back and just read the first verse to get together again. Where it says in Romans 8 verse, verse 1, it says, let me, let me say this first. Before we go there. And maybe, maybe we'll, we'll stop there. Now later we'll come back and we'll talk about this chapter more. This morning... I encouraged you before to read Romans 8. To read it. And I encourage you again to read it. And I, I'm going to say this as... It, 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 <clears throat> excuse, <clears throat> excuse me. If you are struggling with um, worry... If you're feeling discouraged, if you're feeling anxiety, if you're feeling depressed, whatever it may be, we're usually, usually we are in one of three different places. We're in one of three different places. Usually we are either worried, haunted, maybe a better word for that, by our past, by what happened in the past. That haunts us, that kind of worries us, what happened in the past. It shouldn't, but, for, but it can. Or then we're anxious about the future. What will happen in the future? Or then we're weighted down with the present. Many times we're in one of those areas. And let me tell you, Romans 8, if you read through here, let me do verse 1 first, where it says, there is no condemnation. There is therefore no no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but in the Spirit. Did you get that? There is no condemnation. My friends, we can be forgiven by Christ Jesus of our past. And we can walk with Jesus. We don't have to be haunted by our past. We don't have to worry about our past. There is no condemnation because we can be forgiven. We can be freed from our past. Verse 39 says, there's nothing that separates us from the love of God. My friends, whatever takes place in the future, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing. And then there's one more verse. And this is for the present. And it says this here. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and who are called together, called according to his purpose. That's for the present. And I'm going to need to close. I'll come back and finish later. Let me um, just close with this. Um, we just close with a few verses. Let me close with, uh, with reading verses 16 and 17. Verses 16 says, The Spirit itself bears, spirit, bears witness of our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God, joined heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. My friends, walk with Christ. Walk with him. There's also, there's another story that I'm going to share. Maybe next time I'll share it. 
But there's a powerful story about Noah. Noah was the only man, right? Him, his sons, and his sons' wives that went into the ark. Why? Because Noah walked with God. Maybe we can finish up on that later. But he walked with God. And verse 1 says there's no condemnation and that we walk in the Spirit. We walk with Jesus. We walk with him. My friends, stand with me. And my friends, you and I can be more than conquerors, not because we fight and we conquer, but because we are a light and a witness and that we are salt. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. We worship you for you alone are worthy. Glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving. Lord, we just bow in your presence, worshiping you. And Lord, our heart's desire is to worship you, to walk with you, to journey with you, and be in you. Lord, I pray that each one of us here this morning can be more than conquerors. Even though it may look from the world world view like we're losers, like we wouldn't win. But Jesus, we are more than conquerors because of you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.